questions. And we start with Professor Boris Kozinski from Harvard University and Bosch, who will present his work on. I don't want to mess it up. Symmetry and uncertainty aware models of interatomic interactions for molecular dynamics. So. Again, all these talks will be recorded and available online in streaming and on the YouTube page later. The talk will be approximately 40 minutes, so keep your questions to the end. Thank you very much. No. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you to all organizers. It's great to be here. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the um, work we've been doing in the past uh, three years, approximately, building up on some of the techniques you've seen in the introductory uh, lectures. And I'll show some applications, maybe some additional techniques that uh, are uh, uh, being developed to enable essentially machine learning uh, to enter into the sort of field of material simulations and accelerate our calculations. So the big uh, picture is uh, to go from uh, fundamental first principles, you know, many body quantum uh, equation, the Schrodinger equation, and all the way to large complicated structures that we want to simulate at quantum accuracy, uh, uh, such as, you know, uh, mo large organic molecules, maybe uh, uh, catalytic surfaces, uh, but you cannot do it in one step. Uh, it's just very difficult. So first you have to make some approximations. The one common approximation to the quantum problem is the density functional theory. I'll speak very little, uh, but I'll mention some efforts where we are uh, using some machine learning techniques to develop new density functionals uh, that can make uh, calculations cheaper uh, and at the same time more accurate. Then uh, the next piece, which I'll spend most time talking about, is the uh, interatomic potentials, which um, are, of course, very useful if you want to get faster simulations. Uh, but these fast simulations may be very large and uh, might not give you a very good intuition, or might they, they might be still too slow uh, to uh, access certain time scales. So you still need to reduce dimensionality and um, do some coarse graining and uh, uh, find collective variables. Uh, again, I'll, if I have time, I'll mention a little bit of an effort uh, uh, there. But once you put all this together, you know, uh, start from the sort of very fine uh, picture of the quantum interactions, uh, learn density functionals, then learn machine learning potentials, uh, then reduce dimensionality and accelerate your molecular dynamics with some enhanced sampling, then you could possibly get to large scale simulations. So this is overall vision uh, of pieces uh, um, connecting together to enable uh, essentially realistic material simulations, understanding complex phenomena and things like that. Okay, so very briefly, I won't spend time too much on this, but I just want to mention an effort that we started on actually learning uh, uh, exchange correlation functionals for DFT, trying to do better than existing semi-local functionals, which are not very good at a lot of problems, which uh, have um, uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, maybe localized electrons, maybe some of the um, uh, uh, partially occupied orbitals are not doing the right things. So on a high level, what we want to do is uh, bring uh, machine learning to this field uh, in a way that enables you uh, to run fast and at the same time more accurate density functional theory calculations. So in this project, we're trying to learn one piece of it, the exchange energy, which is a non-local quantity of the density. And we're trying to learn it as such, an explicit non-local functional of the exchange energy, which can hopefully give you as high of an accuracy as uh, hybrid calculations without having to do all the expensive exact exchange calculations, which are prohibitive in, in, in plane wave um, settings. So um, we do this by introducing a set of features on the density, essentially learning a, a, uh, a model, which is based on the Gaussian process regression model uh, uh, formalism. Uh, and the features on the density are non-local and they're built up through these sort of uh, complicated looking convolutions. And then uh, you uh, uh, get as a reference set the exchange energy, which you can calculate exactly and try to see, can you come up with a non-local model explicitly as a functional of the density that captures the exchange energy. And it seems like the answer is yes, we're able to capture exchange energy uh, better than some of the uh, uh, leading density functionals out there. Okay, so there's progress in this direction. That's all I wanted to say here, basically to show that the most difficult problem probably in this whole game is getting a good description of the quantum states uh, and getting DFT to a higher accuracy level without sacrificing too much the cost. And um, 
uh, going for these kind of approaches seems to be showing promise as indicated here also in the comparisons of performance uh, between exact exchange calculations and these uh, what we call CIDR calculations, which are based on this formalism. Okay, now onto the main part of the, uh, of the discussion here. We assume we have a quantum model, which is good. So we use as a truth model some DFT or maybe quantum chemistry method, and we want to learn interatomic potentials. In other words, we want to learn um, how energy depends on the, on the positions of the atoms. So this is a many body uh, uh, energy, right? That's a difficult thing to learn. Uh, all the quantum mechanics is hidden in the dependence uh, of the energy on the inter, uh, atomic positions, and of course the species. And uh, we can do it explicitly in quantum mechanics. It's just too slow for any realistic calculations. Existing empirical potentials, uh, as you well know, uh, are not very good. Uh, they're not transferable, even though they're very fast. But what we want is a fast model that at the same time is as accurate as quantum mechanics, hopefully. So this is where machine learning comes in. And uh, the question is, how do we learn this energy from which we can then derive the forces and drive our molecular dynamics? And um, we start, and pretty much everybody in the field starts with uh, a description of the atomic environment, the geometry of it, right? So how do you describe a geometry is very important because based on that, you'll build a learning model and it could be either Gaussian process regression or a neural network. You'll build a learning model that tries to describe this potential energy as accurately as possible and at the same time be, uh, as cheap as possible to evaluate. So you can do large scale fast calculations. So I'll introduce two methods that we've been developing. One is called NICWIP based on neural networks. The other one is called FLAIR based on Gaussian process regression. And um, let me just start with the point that uh, these models need to encode as much as possible of the geometry of the atomic structure. Okay, so if you sacrifice something in the description, uh, the accuracy will suffer. So what is the sort of most um, complete way of capturing uh, geometry? Well, first of all, uh, you want to make sure that the model satisfies all possible physical symmetries. Uh, and what physical symmetries are we talking about here is, uh, you know, the energy should be invariant with respect to rotation. Uh, inversion flipping, right? So basically these are symmetries of 3D space. Uh, this is the O3 symmetry group, the translation. Together with this, it builds the E3 symmetry group. And uh, as well, we have a uh, permutation uh, of atoms of the same type. So once you build these symmetries in, uh, into your model, into your description of the structure, then you're learning uh, some sort of a model uh, that knows the sort of the, the right environment. And you're trying to build as much as possible of uh, complexity of, of richness into this description. Okay. So just to emphasize, there are various ways of building models. You can start with building features, and these features uh, can satisfy these symmetries or not. So if you don't have any sort of constraints, then your features uh, of your model can behave arbitrarily as you transform your structure. Obviously, that's not what you want. You want the energy, at least, to satisfy these symmetries. But the features from which you build the energy model can be either invariant, in other words, they may not change at all uh, if you rotate the structure, for instance, they remain the same, or the richer way of doing this, sort of encoding more information, is to make them equivariant, which means that as you rotate your structure in 3D, your features from which you build the model can also rotate, okay? So this is just one way of saying that, you know, you have some sort of more encoding of the, uh, of the symmetry behavior in your features. Okay, so this is what we call equivariant. Equivariance technically means uh, that, you know, you commute with the operation uh, of the symmetry group, okay? So th this is uh, something that um, uh, Christoph uh, already presented, so I won't go into too much detail here. Um, what I wanna show that, uh, you know, if you wanna build a neural network model of interatomic potentials, uh, the uh, typical, Way of doing it is nowadays uh, to build a graph neural network with what's called message passing. And again, this is already covered in the introductory lecture, so I won't go into too much detail, but just to emphasize again, you basically have atoms talk to each other, send each other messages through this graph neural network and these graph convolutions, basically uh, send information uh, what, uh, what, the, what the atoms see around them. So this atom sees around itself some atoms at a certain distance away. Uh, these are invariant properties, distances, or angles. And you can pass these sort of invariant messages to other atoms. And uh, these, uh, uh, you know, these networks then through multiple layers can encode a lot of the information and can get quite good accuracy uh, when you are uh, asking them to learn the energy, okay? Another 
the generalization of this is to now say, okay, uh, we know that you know building equivariant features has uh, more resolution in terms of what the geometry is doing. And for instance, you now have the ability to resolve uh, in your features vectors or even tensors that know about the orientation and then know about transformations in 3D space. And so you can build an equivariant model. And this is one model that um, we introduced called NEQIP, which instead of scalars, basically invariants, uh, it passes around equivariant messages, which contain tensor information in general. So you have a feature of this network that consists of vectors, scalars, tensors, uh, and um, uh, technically speaking, this is related to what's called the reducible representations of the space group, uh, which you're trying to operate in. And uh, the way we label these uh, is using spherical harmonics. Okay, so spherical harmonics are a convenient basis for uh, irreducible representations in 3D space. They basically allow you to expand any function on the sphere, uh, uh, just like you would do a periodic function in terms of sines and cosines. And then to make a neural network operate in a non-trivial way to pass messages around to have convolutions, you need some way of multiplying, some way of uh, uh, coupling these features, which are tensors. And uh, the uh, proper way to do it, the most general way to do it is using what's called a tensor product, which is an outer product. Uh, which basically uh, takes two tensors and produces another tensor, okay? And so you build this network in such a way that everything inside, unlike a normal neural network, which has numbers, it has tensors and convolutions are tensor product based. And so this is basically, you know, taking a spherical harmonic, uh, 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 multiplying by uh, a tensor feature, and uh, that gives you a message which you pass onto the other atom. So this way, uh, you know, tensor information is being passed around and the network becomes much more aware uh, in terms of geometry of, uh, of the structure. And as a result, it gets much more accurate. Okay, so this is the state of the art, uh, as far as we are aware right now, of the accuracy on a bunch of um, benchmark data sets such, such as the MD17 data set as shown here. And comparison is made here with invariant neural networks and other sort of invariant networks, just basically showing that equivariance is essential in bringing higher accuracy and at the same time uh, in bringing uh, uh, learning efficiency, okay? So um, in fact, these models are able to learn uh, in, uh, in good comparison in terms of the data efficiency with kernel-based methods, which you've heard about as being sort of more data efficient. Well, these neural networks seem to be doing as well, if not better. So this is sort of a change of paradigm in some ways saying that, you know, Deep neural networks do not require millions of data points to be trained. In fact, they can train on rather small amounts as long as you build uh, the uh, infrastructure in a way that respects symmetry. Okay. So there's another example for water that basically shows that compared to uh, the DeepMD model here, um, which does not have equivariance, um, one is able to learn on a thousand uh, times fewer data and still have higher accuracy in terms of, uh, in terms of forces. Okay. The interesting thing also in these networks is that as soon as you go to higher rank, in other words, you go from scalar to vector, you change not only the accuracy, but also the rate at which the network learns. So this is the log log scale of the accuracy of forces with respect to uh, the size of the training set. So this, the slope, the scale, uh, the scaling uh, law of learning is actually changed itself, which is something that's a bit puzzling is still not understood um, uh, theoretically. Okay, this is all good. Uh, accuracy is high, but these networks are slow. Why are they slow? Uh, is because message passing inherently involves interactions between atoms iteratively. So in other words, one atom sees what another atom is seeing, and that atom sees what another atom is seeing. And so information propagates this way. Um, and why would you want to have this propagation multiple uh, steps? Well, you have multiple layers in the network. This essentially induces many body interaction. In other words, if you only have interaction with your nearest neighbor, uh, then, okay, so this is uh, a two-body interaction, but if you have a nearest neighbor seeing another nearest neighbor, then you can use higher order interactions and have a many-body character in your energy, which is actually you want, because the energy is a many-body quantity. Uh, quantum mechanically, it could be kind of complicated. So um, as a side effect of this, you have a long range uh, communication between atoms. Maybe that's a good thing, uh, because you know, that way you can also capture long range interactions, but uh, maybe it's not necessary, but what it does do for sure is it increases the uh, uh, effective number of neighbors. In other words, if you go to six layers, for instance, uh, with the six angstrom cutoff in let's say bulk water simulation, you all of a sudden end up with 20,000 neighbors for every atom on which you're trying to calculate uh, force. 
And that makes it very difficult to scale. In other words, it's very, very difficult to paralyze over a large number of uh, uh, computational devices because you have to carry around all this weight. Okay, so this is not a scalable approach. You can do it on one GPU, but doing it in, on, uh, already on two GPUs is not possible. So this is an effort that um, it tries to go around this. And the, the idea here is to keep equivariance and with its magic sort of accuracy inducing properties, but without the message passing that has the sort of propagation of information in the distance. Okay. And how this, this is done, this is called the Allegro model that is re recently uh, introduced and put in an archive if you're interested. Uh, it, instead of trying to absorb all the information into one atom, which may be limiting and, and forces the atoms to sort of carry around this information and pass to each other, instead what this model does is uh, assigns information, assigns features to pairs of atoms. So there are more pairs, so that costs you a little bit more, but uh, as a result, you can encode enough information on the edge for instance, between these two atoms here. Uh, and this edge can communicate with another edge with another pairwise interaction. And this way you can still induce many body character by sort of convolving over these kind of features in your neural network, but you can make the math work out in such a way that the information never propagates out of the immediate neighborhood, okay? So I won't spend too much time on the math here, but it is this, quite similar to an equip uh, in the sense that you have features uh, on the edge let's say between atoms I and J that, uh, just minimize this here, that interact with the information from the spherical harmonics, basically information about the direction of another edge, okay? And so this has directionality, this has all the tensor sort of uh, information about uh, the atomic positions uh, uh, other than atom J. So what all the other atoms K in the neighborhood are doing is all encoded. And uh, essentially, Due to the fact that you know you only have interaction between atom I and J, atom I and K1, atom I and K2, and so forth, <clears throat> there is no uh, direct information between atom uh, J being passed to atom K2, for instance. So this is a strictly local model that is still equivariant, still many body, and uh, <clears throat> as a result, um, you know it can scale. Before we go to the scaling, I just want to show that the accuracy is not worse than the quip. Uh, in all the benchmark data sets uh, like MG17, like this sort of transferability test on a 3 BPA molecule, uh, which was uh, explored widely, uh, or I guess in detail in the, um, in the group of Gabor Jani. Basically the question is, if you have a low temperature uh, dynamics on which you train for this molecule, which has torsional kind of interesting dynamics, uh, can the model extrapolate, can it predict what's happening at higher temperature? And uh, both NEQIP and the Allegro models are able to do that quite well, which is, uh, which is good news that, that they can generalize out of domain in this, in this kind of a test. And they're comparable in accuracy. Okay, now onto the sort of, uh, what's special about this is again, you can scale it. You can deploy this on multiple GPUs. And just to, sh to show you some strong scaling data, this is going up to 400,000 atoms or so uh, on, uh, I forget how many GPUs exactly. Uh, but uh, basically you can get very good performance on a large scale simulation going even up to hundred million atoms. And this is uh, in the case of 128 GPUs. And uh, you still have the same accuracy that is basically state of the art compared to quantum mechanics. And you can run you know, complicated simulations like you know, glass dynamics and diffusion of lithium ions in a, in a realistic solid electrolyte com consisting of multiple species and showing that it agrees very well with uh, DFT dynamics. Okay, so this was neural networks. Neural networks are accurate. They are now scalable. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what they don't have is uncertainty, but not yet at least, um, <clears throat> but it is needed, especially needed for simulations that involve rare events, such as uh, reactions or uh, maybe phase transitions. And sometimes you don't know ahead of time what kind of uh, situations you will end up in as you run your molecular dynamics. And yeah, when we train our models, we often experience when we go to large scale, big simulations, that something goes wrong and the model just explodes. And we don't know why, but we know it's probably outside of the training set. Some forces got predicted incorrectly. The model doesn't have any physical priors other than symmetry, doesn't know, you know what, what it needs to do uh, when it's really out of domain. So you need to know uncertainty. You need to know how unreliable the model is uh, based on the geometry. And so one way to build this in is to use kernel methods. A kernel method allows you to compare a configuration, a structure with another structure. And so if you can compare a configuration to which you're predicting with a structure set, which is in your training set, then you can say if it's close or far away. And that way you can actually 
build an algorithm that uh, can uh, complain, saying, I cannot predict this force. It's too far away from my training set. I'm uncertain. I'm going to give you junk. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to instead do something else. I'm going to run quantum mechanics and get that data point again. So this is what's called active learning. And you can automatically add configurations as you go, uh, making sure that you're not going to get into any trouble without knowing it. Okay, so you basically what you're doing is you're trying to learn on the points that matter as you go in your molecular dynamics instead of the points that are available to you, which you may have seen a million times and they're not adding any more information. Okay, so how do we do it? Technically speaking, well, uh, this one starts from another thing you've seen uh, is uh, sort of a, a very complete way of representing atomic environments called the atomic cluster expansion introduced by Ralph Routes um, a few years ago. And uh, this again, sort of starts with resolving uh, a configuration in uh, radial functions and spherical harmonics. Um, it's one choice of, uh, of setting up a basis. And uh, then you can construct equivariant descriptors from these, from these functions. Equivariance comes from the fact that spherical harmonics are equivariant. And uh, then uh, because you, you want to construct a kernel, you need some sort of a sort of a scalar that uh, needs to come out. You form an invariant uh, by uh, um, uh, an outer product of, of these C equivariant coefficients for themselves and uh, uh, summing over one of the indices. So you use some sort of mathematical theorems of spherical harmonics to arrive at these invariants. And then based on these invariants, which end up being descriptors of your atomic environment, you can build a kernel. Okay, so these uh, uh, kernels, you can use a dot product kernel, which is what we use, or the dot product of these descriptors to some power, um, uh, as inspired by the gap potential formalism. You can build a model of the local energy. In other words, you give it as an input, a local environment, this description of where the atoms are on the central atom, build those descriptors from the ACE formalism, uh, going up to certain body order, or up to certain sort of resolution and angular and radial basis, and um, then do Gaussian process regression. Again, I won't go through the details, you've seen this. Uh, basically, um, you need to construct kernels between the point on which you're predicting, the descriptor, and uh, the point in your training set, the points in the training set. You can use sparse Gaussian processes, which reduces the number of training points, but the principle is pretty much the same. Why do this is because uh, Gaussian process regression is a Bayesian method. It gives you not only a prediction of the value of the energy, it also gives you a um, uh, posterior distribution on the prediction from which you can derive the variance. Variance is uncertainty. Okay, so as illustrated here, if you're close to a training point, your variance is low, your uncertainty is low. If you're far away, the variance grows. And this gives you an ability to judge how far away you are from a training point in your training set and assess whether you're comfortable or reliable or not in your prediction. And you can automate this. Basically, every prediction now comes with an uncertainty. If uncertainty is too high, you say, okay, no more. I'm going to call DFT on this exact structure and uh, make sure I have now a reliable label. And so this is an active learning loop, which is introduced in this Flare uh, um, software. And this is an action, you know, trying to learn a phase of a um, uh, aluminum crystal from scratch. Nothing at all uh, given to the model. It's completely un unknown what the interactions are. And it starts requesting data. And these are the black points basically uh, indicating DFT calculations being cold because uncertainty is still too high. And at some point, uncertainty gets lower because it has now a lot of points covering the space of configurations. And now it says, okay, I don't need any more DFT. And then what we do after this is done is we basically uh, turn on the temperature to melt it. Completely different state it hasn't seen before. And it reacts automatically by saying, oh, okay, uncertainty is high again. I'm seeing new things. I'm gonna call a bunch more DFT calculations. And then it learns the liquid phase as well. So this is a very simple example of how this active learning uh, gives you an automatic way of developing interatomic potentials, essentially without you having to think about what to put in your training set. Now you might say this is gonna be slow because the more points I add to my training set, the more I have to compare every new point I'm gonna to predict to everything in my training set. So my cost will glow, grow linearly with the size of the training set. And that's in principle, always true for Gaussian process regression, um, but it can be bypassed with a trick it was a particular structure of a kernel. Again, I said that we use a dot product kernel uh, raised to second power. Uh, and uh, uh, what this allows you to do is actually to reshuffle the indices in the summation for the prediction to pre-compute uh, certain quantities and to pre-compute correlations uh, between um, uh, points in your training set so that the prediction becomes essentially a matrix vector multiplication. In other words, a constant 
as a function of the training set size. So in other words, you freeze the model at some point, you say, okay, I'm done. Uh, this is my training set. I'm gonna compute this matrix beta, uh, which uh, will then give me this sort of polynomial second uh, order polynomial model uh, in the descriptor size. And it's a constant as a function of the training set at this point. So uh, this allows the calculation to be very fast even though it's coming out of a, a, a Gaussian process regression model. And this is a, a trick inspired by some of the earlier work by Claudio Zeni and uh, Aldo Guillermo in a different structure of a kernel, but this is exactly sort of the trick that uh, they also use to come up with a very fast model out of Gaussian process regression. So in this case, we do it for a many body interaction instead, but uh, still very much the same in spirit. One thing I also wanna mention is that we can also map not only the prediction of the forces and energies, also uncertainties. So now your model becomes a fully Bayesian force field, in other words, uh, at essentially constant cost to get a prediction of energies, forces, stresses, whatever you want, um, uh, plus uncertainties on those quantities. Okay, so now you can basically do a, a simulation, monitor the uncertainty without having to go through sort of this Gaussian process machinery every time and uh, train models like this one, for instance, this is silicon carbide going through a phase transformation as a function of pressure, uh, which you, know, you run in one way, you're compressing and then decompressing and you see a phase change and you see uncertainty spike um, above a threshold, which induces uh, these DFT calculations to be uh, called uh, and added to the training set. And eventually, sort of by going this direction and in that direction, you're able to learn the entire model that can be described the, uh, the phase transformation of silicon carbide. And it matches DFT much more accurately than any existing uh, interatomic potential. Um, and it essentially proceeds automatically uh, to, learn, uh, to learn the model. And, you know, uh, what you can do is now uh, actually explicitly simulate the phase transformation with pre-nucleating a second phase within the large simulation, which is great for reducing hysteresis. Uh, and uh, this is basically showing that, you know, you get the right phases, uh, zinc blend going to rock salt. Actually, you get some interesting twin boundary behavior automatically emerging for some reason because of symmetry breaking. But the important thing is that it matches experimental observations, which are these colored points. Uh, very accurately. So in other words, you get this sort of DFT accurate uh, description that you can take to, to larger scale. Very quickly, you also get good vibrational properties and you can also do thermal conductivity. If you're in the field of thermal conductivity, just wanna quickly advertise another code we're uh, developing called Phoebe, which allows you to do Boltzmann transport for electrons and phonons. I'm not gonna talk about it, but just to show you that, you know, this, this can uh, achieve quite reliable thermal conductivity prediction in comparison to experiment here. And for those calculations that you cannot use phonons like glasses or liquids or whatnot, uh, things that are not periodic, you can you still produce thermal conductivity predictions using these fast uh, force fields using the green Kubo formalism. And this is essentially looking at the autocorrelation functions of the heat flux. So you define the heat flux using local energies, local stresses, do autocorrelation. And these are very long, very large simulations you need to do for which molecular dynamics uh, with new machine learning potentials is actually the appropriate method because these are expensive. You cannot afford to do very many of these with uh, density functional theory calculations. And this is an example of you know, getting um, uh, to experimental accuracy uh, for sodium chloride, which is a very unharmonic uh, crystal uh, for which uh, uh, you essentially need to do uh, green Kubo calculations. Okay. Now onto some more fun uh, applications. Now in sort of surface science and catalysis, I want to show you sort of an earlier version of Flare. We investigated the system of um, uh, a palladium island uh, being deposited on a silver substrate. And uh, experimentally, what they were seeing is uh, some interesting evolution of these islands of palladium getting thicker and mixed the, with the silver, producing some of the sort of interesting catalytic properties which are not available in either palladium or silver because of their uh, different properties. One metal is too, too active, the other one is too inactive, and the sweet spot in catalysis is always some mixture. So this is one experimental way of doing it, but it was not clear what was happening. So uh, these kind of calculations with uh, flare force field uh, were able to um, explain and give you a mechanism of how the mixing is actually happening. So these sort of uh, uh, silver atoms, the blue ones, start getting into the island from the sides, and the island starts growing and mixing, and you end up with these sort of two layer structures now, and silver is getting sucked in uh, to mix with palladium at the expense of the surface layer. So you actually start etching away the surface layer of silver. And this is exactly what the STM images are showing. So this is explaining the mechanism of this very complicated surface restructuring uh, process, which gives you these catalytically active structures. Another example uh, that you can now uh, do with these kind of force field uh, is I think for the first time to see the uh, herringbone reconstruction 
of the gold 111 uh, surface as shown here. This is sort of basically spontaneously emerging from a large scale simulation of about 400,000 atoms with these mini body flare models. And um, uh, compares quite well with experimental pictures that you see these beautiful herringbone patterns uh, caused by the strain mismatch, uh, the lattice mismatch between the surface layer and the sublayer of gold. And uh, uh, this uh, allows you to investigate the entire surface structures reconstruction phase diagram uh, of metals, and not only the 111, but any sort of index, which is what we're trying to do right now. And you can also see uh, dynamics of uh, uh, nanoparticles. So again, for catalysis, uh, catalysis applications, you often want to know what happens if I do a core shell nanoparticle, anneal it, expose it to some gases to bring the active metal back to the surface. These very complicated bimetallic dynamics uh, can now be probed with these kind of uh, methods. And you can see sort of both uh, the heating and the cooling simulations are showing the behavior of the surface and behavior of the mixture uh, of the metals. Okay, skip this. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay, very good. All right, um, now reactions. This is sort of the, the main thing we're after, is reactive systems with heterogeneous settings. So all the complexity that is very difficult to achieve with interatomic force fields based on uh, classical formalisms like ReXFF, for instance, uh, are now starting to become available. An example we started looking at is hydrogen interacting with platinum. This is a prototypical uh, catalytic uh, reaction where hydrogen gets to the surface, splits, then recombines with another hydrogen and desorbs. So a couple of very different kind of reactive events are happening and things are much more complicated because of the high coverage of the surface, um, which you need to explore with large scale dynamics. Uh, what traditionally you do in catalysis is DFT calculations in gas phase, in other words, in vacuum of a single molecule as shown here interacting on the surface, but things get much more complicated when there's a lot of these molecules and they're all very coupled and correlated. So we don't wanna assume anything about the mechanism and uh, we wanna simulate actually explicitly the full reactive uh, uh, dynamics, okay? So uh, this is now done again with active learning with clarity, starting with the hydrogen uh, gas because you need to describe the hydrogen phase, uh, the bulk platinum, the surface, and now uh, hydrogen interacting with platinum. The red atoms showing up in these uh, pictures is indicate atoms that are uncertain. During the molecular dynamics run, when it's actively learning, atoms occasionally blip red saying, this is a new environment I haven't seen, add it to the training set. So this is this active learning going on, trying to see if it can um, uh, capture all the configurations relevant for describing this kind of reaction without any prior assumption. Okay, so what is this? Okay. Um, the, um, oh, interesting. The most learning actually is happening in the combined hydrogen and platinum simulation, which is not surprising. This is where most of the novelty is uh, for the system and it spends most of the time learning compared to the pure bulks, uh, platinum or, pu or pure gas uh, hydrogen. How do I get rid of this? One second. I think somebody must have drawn something on Zoom. I'm not sure what. Anyhow, um, this is a summary of what uh, actually is being uh, requested by the active learning process and you can see that um, uh, actually as expected, most of the time in terms of wall hours, in terms of real time is spent learning the hydrogen and platinum uh, interaction and rather little, in fact, only if a small number of calculations uh, is requested by this active learning procedure for uh, hydrogen and platinum itself. Okay, so overall, this whole training process takes about a week using sort of DFT calculations in the sequence. So this is not paralyzed, We're basically just you know, running DFT, doing the active learning, uh, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the calculation is, again, uh, running DFT on hydrogen and platinum. So a week compared to months of manual tweaking of uh, something like a reactive force field is pretty good. Okay, so this is something that you can now uh, 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 you know, develop and then run a larger scale simulation. So this is now, uh, after the mapping procedure, this is now about a thousand atoms. Now you can run uh, longer dynamics uh, and, and collect statistics on the actual reactions to see if reactions making sense. And so we can collect the number of reactive events as a function of time uh, and do it as a bunch of, at a bunch of temperatures and see if we can uh, extract the activation energy from, this, from the Arrhenius behavior. Um, we can uh, build this log scale plot and compare with experiment. And encouragingly experimental value that was measured in uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange uh, 
reactions, which is essentially the same kinetics, um, is showing a number that is very close to what this kind of fully explicit reactive simulation is producing. Okay. And now the question, so we did the thousand atoms. Uh, how big can these simulations get? Uh, and we sort of decided to stress test this in the last couple of weeks. We requested some time on the, uh, on the biggest machine we could find in the US and try to run the simulations. Before being able to do that, uh, we spent some time uh, optimizing the code for multiple GPUs. So this was done with uh, the Cocos library and LAMPS, uh, which are um, uh, being developed uh, at the national labs in the, in the US. And um, by uh, putting Flare, the mapped version of Flare, as a pair style, if you're familiar with LAMPS, uh, into the code, and uh, making sure that you know, the memory access patterns and GPUs are efficiently implemented so that you can access um, these very large scales, you know, we can actually see that there's a big benefit to using GPUs, for instance, compared to CPUs. And the scaling can be quite efficient. And uh, if you now have access to 27,000 GPUs, uh, you can run up to uh, half a trillion atoms. And um, this is this little point here, right there. And you can see that, you know, actually you don't lose that much performance. Um, uh, you actually, uh, you know, pretty efficiently scaling. Okay, so it's not a very fast simulation in real time. I mean, we did, I forget how many MD steps, not too many MD steps with this, but it was just to show that, you know, you can reach these size uh, scales. You don't need them, of course, uh, for this kind of simulations. But uh, in order to actually explicitly simulate reactions that we want, we do need millions uh, of atoms for a long time because some of the reactions on catalytic uh, surfaces may not be very fast. So this is one way of, of sort of uh, finding out what's actually happening on catalytically relevant um, uh, structures. Okay. And this is, by the way, the movie. Uh, it's, it's a small snapshot. You can actually see the atoms here, uh, but uh, on, on an actual simulation, there's so many you don't see them anymore. Anyhow, this is basically showing that, you know, this is number of reactions proceeding sort of linearly, as you expect, with the number of time steps taken, and that uncertainty is well behaved. Uh, this was not uh, immediately the case. Some of the uh, first simulations uh, we're giving high uncertainty in some cases. And again, this is an indication of the fact that we still haven't learned everything we needed to learn. And the large scale simulation did encounter a couple of events that was still uncertain about. So we had to go back and retrain uh, a few more uh, snapshots. Okay, but this is enabled, I should say importantly, this is enabled by the fact that even at large scale, even with a 500 billion atom simulation, you could in principle get uncertainty on every atom. And so on billion atom level simulations, we do get uncertainty on every atom. We can see, you know, is every atom well behaved or not? Okay. Uh, just a few words on other things we're doing because I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. But now that you have this sort of formalism, you can go to a larger scale. And why do you need actually very, very large simulations is because you want to do bio, uh, you know, interactions of drugs uh, with proteins and things like that. And this is large scale and long time. So you do need to reduce dimensionality and speed up things even further. So coarse graining is one idea and you can develop coarse grained force fields also using the flare formalism. This is one example being done uh, by uh, Blake and our group is trying to learn coarse grained um, uh, interatomic force fields uh, of alkane liquids and trying to capture uh, essentially the radial distribution function, the structure of the liquid, looking at uh, the distribution of chain lengths, for instance, here uh, and uh, making sure that uncertainty actually tracks the uh, uh, the ensemble standard deviation of these models so that you know you actually have predictive uncertainty. And the loop is just slightly more complicated. And if you encounter something uncertain, you go back to the fine grain model, retrain it, and go back to the coarse grain model again. So this is a double, double active learning loop that you can implement here. And finally, I just want to mention very quickly uh, an effort to reduce dimensionality to find collective variables. And again, this is just a, uh, uh, a point to make that if you have large amounts of molecular dynamics data, you can reduce dimensionality and actually automatically discover what the low dimensional manifold is that's driving your reaction on which you can then put some biases and run much faster accelerated MD with you know, enhanced sampling and things like that. And this is, again, I won't spend time discussing this, but this is done with a um, uh, encoder-like approach, uh, compressing uh, the dimensionality non-linearly uh, and trying to, uh, again, bring this sort of third level of machine learning into accelerating molecular dynamics simulation. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thanks to everybody who did this work actually and the funding sources and the computational resources. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, thank you very much, boys, for this amazing talk. And we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. So So thank you very much for the interesting talk. I saw you showed a figure about evaluating migration of uh, an ionic migration of lithium in an electrolyte. Uh, so this software could be used to, uh, to, to reproduce, to calculate a, a lithium migration. How, how could it do that? Yeah, uh, actually the, the main reason we actually got into machine learning potentials is exactly the question of how to uh, discover uh, new electrolytes. In other words, how to compute diffusion coefficients. And uh, this is done with molecular dynamics and observing the mean square displacement. Uh, and you know this figure that I showed compared to the DFT. So as good as your DFT, uh, uh, then your prediction will be essentially uh, matching DFT accuracy. So this is uh, shown for lithium phosphate here. The blue curve is um, ab initial molecular dynamics. The red curve is a bunch of trajectories run with Allegro. So it's it's matching as well as you would expect. So yeah, I think uh, you can uh, once you've trained the model uh, appropriately, you can. Uh, run a much faster simulation and looking at uh, diffusion uh, coefficients with mean square displacement or maybe some more co complicated green Kubo approaches which don't uh, assume any uncorrelated regimes but uh, yeah okay one last question from the audience uh, in your active learning slide i don't remember the slide number so where you had the active learning loop going on yep um did you try benchmarking against random uh, leap sampling from points. So not using the uncertainty at all, like just randomly sampling for whatever you were. Yeah, yeah, we, I don't have a plot here, but we have a plot in the, uh, in the uh, NPG uh, computational materials paper that introduced Flare comparing the two approaches. So yeah, you do see an efficiency gain going for active learning as you would expect from sort of maximally using the information that's coming compared to completely random. It's not always true, though. It depends on the system. It depends on whether there is a benefit to learning actively. In some cases, uh, in homogeneous liquids, for instance, you could probably do just as well with random sampling. But in some cases, with rare events or actually driving the dynamics, then you do get benefit from active learning. Thank you again, I'm sorry we don't have time for further questions, but Boris will be here all day, at least, and probably all week to answer your question one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you again to Boris. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.